um, I want to say welcome. We're, my name is Ann Lee. I'm the dietitian for Char. However, I'll be very honest, this is all about gluten-free and living the gluten-free life and how to do it right. And um, that's the beginning and end of the, the bonus for Char. We're done. So from that point, uh, what I'd like to do is to walk you through a journey of really embracing the gluten-free life and giving you tips and tricks on how to make it as normal and as healthy as we possibly can. How many people are newly diagnosed? Oh, good. So how many people have been diagnosed for more than like five years? Ah, okay. Uh, anyone diagnosed longer than that? No, okay, then you're our mentor for everyone else here, okay? And that's a, okay. Well, it's a very important role because we remember when you first were told you had celiac disease, how did you feel? Totally overwhelmed, right? We want to make this different. We want to make it where it's not, you don't feel like you're a deer in the headlights. Okay, so let's start. First, we're going to talk about celiac disease because I'm sure a lot of you feel like when you were diagnosed, you thought, it's what? I have who? Um, it's actually a disease that has been around since Hippocrates. You know that very famous Hippocrates quote, let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food? I honestly believe he and Archuus were talking about celiac disease because that's our only treatment. And that's how long ago these physicians were actually writing about what we now know as celiac disease. Interestingly, it wasn't until the 1800s that really Samuel Gee was the first one to put all the pieces together. Up to that point, he kept describing um, so, you know, what we now know as celiac disease as there's this strange ailment that affects one or two people out of the family and they just fail. We don't know why they waste away. Um, you know, and the rest of the family is eating the same things. They're all doing really well, but those one or two individuals just don't do well. And we now know that it is celiac disease, but it took until 1950 when Dr. Dickey was actually a pediatric resident, pediatric gastroenterologist resident in the um, hospitals in London during World War II. Who remembers their history? What happened in World War II? Yes, we did, but in the UK, there was actually, the Germans were bombing London. And in those bombing raids and everything else, what happened is that bread got rationed and flour got rationed. So that when you were living in London, there were often weeks and weeks and weeks that you had no bread and no flour. What Dr. Dickey found out is that his patients, his kids on the, on the pediatric ward, did 100% better when they had no bread and flour. And so it was because of that that he actually put the pieces together and figured out what it was. And today we know it's an autoimmune disease. We know that it's genetic. We know it affects 1% of the population. So we really are dealing with something that's new. Now why that's important too is that you'll read in all the, the press that Oprah's now on a gluten-free diet and Elizabeth Hasselbeck is on a gluten-free diet and the tennis player is putting himself in oxygen tanks and he's on a gluten-free diet. And the thing is, that's all well and good for them, but that's not the real deal. What we're dealing with is celiac disease and that's the real deal. So it's important to kind of make sure that, you know, when you're talking to your family and friends, that they know, yes, there are a lot of people that are on a fad diet, but we're dealing this from a real medical reason. And th it's, it's different. What happens to us with celiac disease is if we imagine that little spot is a crumb, that crumb actually crosses through the intestinal lining and meets up with the gene that you need to have to have celiac disease. And it forms these great big T cells. And how many people have heard of T cells? Okay, is it a good or bad thing? T cells are associated usually with cancers and things, so it's not a good thing. And that's what happens with celiac disease. It actually then makes antibodies and cytokines and it causes the damage in the, in the intestinal wall. And that's different than the people that are just doing this for a trend. This doesn't happen to them. And that's why it's important that not only do we, that we know that this is what happens, but this makes it important to stay on the diet. What it happens to our intestine, come on, sit down, is that our intestine should look like this guy, where there's all those wonderful finger-like projections that absorb all the nutrients that your body is eating from the food. But with celiac disease, when that whole cascade of events happen, our intestines look like this. They're as flat as pancakes. And that's a problem because now we can't absorb any of the nutrients from our food. And that's the difference between doing this for a fad 
and doing this for real. So what, is this, what, what else do we know about celiac disease? We know it's 1% of the population. Doesn't matter where you were born, what color your skin, it's everywhere, 1% across the board. And because we often have patients um, that will say, well, I'm of Asian descent or African descent, and you can't have celiac disease. And actually, my kids are half Asian and half Irish, and guess what? They have celiac disease. So it can be anywhere. And it's actually as common in Ethiopia as it is in Ireland. And I always tell our relatives that. It's everywhere. Now, classic presentation. And this is important because you can present in many different ways. The classic presentation, which is that abdominal pain, diarrhea, the failing, everything that Dickey and Gee and all, you know, all those guys described, is usually found in kids. When we were at Columbia Celiac Disease Center, only 60% of our adults actually presented with these kind of symptoms. What we see is often this is what the pediatricians and the doctors think this is what celiac disease should look like. But here I'm going to show you a, a nice little, that hopeful sign. This is my same patient six months later on a gluten-free diet. That's the dramatic difference. You take those things, that gluten out, and look how great this can be. So that's the first thing. Gluten-free diet can be great because look at the results, all right? Now, what about for the rest of us that were diagnosed later in life? We can present with anything, anemia, reflux, early bone loss, um, infertility for women. It can be anything at all. And that's important to make sure your doctor knows that just because your symptoms don't fit that classic kind of scenario, it doesn't mean it's not celiac disease. It can present in many, many different ways. It can even present as in dental enamel defects. How many of you go to the dentist and talk about that your teeth hurt? Okay, why is that? Well, you're not absorbing calcium, so you don't have the enamel on your teeth. That can be linked to celiac disease. Okay, oops, go back. There, okay, let's look at what is gluten. Okay, we kind of talked about the history, and I know, you like those Legos? <laughs> the reason their Legos are up there is because we often talk about we're on a gluten-free diet. But what does that mean, okay? Gluten is that very common term that's used to describe the protein in grains. Now, have you ever turned over a box that says gluten-free and on it it says corn gluten or rice gluten and you look at it and you go like, well, is that okay or not okay? It actually is okay because gluten is really just that term for the protein found in grains. For us with celiac disease, we're talking about specifically the protein that's found in wheat, rye, and barley. And it's a very, very specific type of protein. It's like your Legos. You know when you put your Legos together and you line them up a certain way? Well, the protein in wheat, rye, and barley have to have a sequence of 33 amino acids that have to be lined up just right. So it's only wheat, rye, and barley that is affected, that affects us with celiac disease, okay? So it's like those Lego strips. That's the good news, because all the other grains are totally fine. So grains that are not, are not okay are wheat, rye, barley, spelt, tricolé, any derivative thereof. I don't care if the wheat is sprouted or it's wheat grass. It's still wheat, and it's not okay. So no matter what they do to it, it's still not good. It still has those 33 amino acids in it. All the things that are okay are the rice, the corn, potato, and those are the things that are common, you, commonly used in gluten-free. But there's also amaranth and quinoa and um, mullet and so many things that we can use. Okay, so basics. How many of you have started on the diet for how long? How long? Oh, okay, this is perfect timing. How are you doing so far? That's going to get better. This is good news. <laughs> It may take time, but it will get better. The basics are that when you look at your fridge or when you go to the grocery store, if you look at the fridge and look at the grocery store and shop from kind of a healthy perspective, if you shop the whole perimeter of the store, you're shopping in fresh fruits and vegetables, the deli counter, the meat counter, the dairy aisle, and um, just skip the bakery, go right by that. All of that is naturally gluten-free. So if you think about the basics in your fridge, the basics of your diet, all your meats, fish, poultry, eggs, dairy, cheese, fruits and vegetables, all your milk products, that's all okay. The only thing that we really need to work on 
is, and see, yes, you can have survival guide, it's easy, is um, the grain part. And we'll talk more about those different grains. But other things that may come up that have been on old list, you can't have vinegar, you can't have caramel color, those are all safe. Anything that is distilled actually has the protein removed. So even your rye, rum, and whiskey are okay, as well as your wine, your champagne. I know, see, life is getting better by the moment, isn't it, okay? Um, <laughs> we have to, you know, it's, it's early, I understand, but it is a Saturday, we'll make life good. Um, but all of these things that have been questioned in the past are totally safe. Now, other things that you may need to look for, though, and you do need to be careful of, are these foods. Anything, a soup, a seasoning, anything that comes in a package, you have to look at it very carefully. Because once it's packaged, boxed, or processed, then it is more likely it might have some gluten or wheat added to it as an extender. Also, low-fat foods. I know as we start trying to be healthy, we look for low-fat foods. But if they take the fat out, what do they do? They have to replace it with something. Often, barley or wheat are the things that are added back in. So, hidden sources is another area we need to be careful of. And especially when we're starting, there seems to be so many areas. So we want to give you those tidbits that the perimeter of the store is safe, and think packaged you need to kind of be careful of. And even if you ignore them for a while and come back to them later when you've got more of a, uh, your footing on the ground, but these things you need to be aware of. Medications. The active ingredient in a medication is a very, very, very small part of that pill or that tablet. So they have to add something to make it where it's big enough for you to swallow. Those extenders most of the time are cornstarch, but they can also be wheat starch or wheat flour. So you need to check with your medications. Um, soy sauce has wheat in it. I know it doesn't seem like soy sauce is something that's thickened, but it has wheat flour in it, so you need to watch that. Cake icing, and for the kids, Play-Doh, paper mache, a lot of your arts and crafts stuff in school is all wheat-based. And you can say, well, okay, but who eats Play-Doh? How many of you have kids? They eat Play-Doh. They drink bath water. Therefore, for kids, you need to make sure the shampoo, the soap, whatever they're using in the tub, is gluten-free. Whatever they're playing with in school, if they're using regular Play-Doh and such, that's fine, but they need to go and wash their hands well when they're done. And the most important is, because where do you do your arts and crafts in school? Right on your desk, right? On the table? Where do you eat lunch? On the desk. That's a source of potential cross-contamination. So you have to make sure that in your lunch boxes, moms and dads, we need to pack either paper towel or something that the kids can put on top of the table to act as a barrier between all that arts and crafts stuff and their lunch. So um, make sure that you talk to the teachers. The kids need to be able to wash their hands with soap and water. The sanitizer may get rid of germs, but it doesn't get rid of gluten. And so that way they can do school OK. And yes, I know it's summertime. Sunscreen and lotions are important. Make sure they're gluten-free for the kids because it does end up in their mouth. It really does. Um, so that's, yes. Yes. Um, for the vegetarian kind of entrees, um, garden burger and boca burgers and things like that, when they take, when they're not using protein, what they often use to hold that all together and as a source of protein is wheat gluten because it, it's a high protein content, but it also works to bind it together. When we think of regular wheat bread or a croissant or think of your favorite wheat-based bread product, it has a certain texture, a certain taste to it. That's actually from that protein, the elasticity of the protein in wheat that gives it that taste and texture. That's why they use it to bind so many things together and for low-fat products because that wheat gluten actually kind of glues it together and makes it a, you know, a good shape and size and, and a good form. When we take that out for gluten-free baked products, that's why they tend to be more crumbly and more dry because we're missing that nice moist protein content. But vegetarian items often use wheat gluten as that protein substitute for that. However, there are several um, companies that do vegetarian options that are not wheat-based. Um, Dr. Prager's is one. There's another one, I think it's um, Amy's. 
is another one. But be careful with Amy's because she does gluten-free things as well as not gluten-free things, and you have to make sure you're grabbing the right box, okay? So just be, and there's a couple others. It's um, Franklin Farms, I think, is another one. But there's a couple. Just read, read your labels carefully. Okay, we're good? Okay. Um, it's a diet for life. How many of you before being diagnosed with celiac disease were on diets? Okay, how good were you on those diets? Okay, it's human nature. It's really hard because being on a diet is not the easiest thing in the world. However, we need to think of the gluten-free diet not as a diet but as a lifestyle because we need to stick with this. We need to be good, 100%. And it's important because we don't know what those long-term effects of getting that trace amount of gluten in here and there can do to the intestine. So we need to kind of approach this that this isn't a diet like Weight Watchers or something else. This is how I'm going to be living a healthy lifestyle. So see how this is changing slowly as we talk, hopefully making it better so far, okay? Okay, all right. Um, we need to be very careful with cross-contamination, as we said, even with the lunches. It only takes an eighth of a teaspoon of flour to actually cause that damage that we see in the intestine. It's not very much. So we need to be very practical. Do we need to be crazy and wear hazmat suits at home? No. How many people, well, it's because people will say, that's it, I'm throwing everything out. Everyone has to eat gluten-free in the house. How practical is that when you're in a family that has some people that need gluten-free and some people that don't? It's way too expensive. So the things to do is you do need a couple items. You need a separate toaster. Absolutely. Have you ever looked inside your toaster? There's all kinds of stuff hanging out in there. You need a separate toaster. Now, the good thing is for the people that are doing gluten-free, you get the new stuff, okay? So prick a pretty color, <laughs> make it fun. The other thing is color coordinate it. If you're getting the new toaster and new utensils, okay, make them all the same color because then it's a great visual cue so that when Aunt Tilly comes over to help with Thanksgiving dinner, she doesn't grab the wrong spoon and stir in the wrong pot. So make it fun and make it something that encourages you to do it right. So um, separate toasters, separate utensils, no croutons off the salad. It, you know, and this happens all the time. You'll say, I want a salad, absolutely no croutons, I need to be gluten-free. And even in the restaurants that have gluten-free menus, they don't always get it right. Um, sabotage the salad, sabotage the meal. If they bring you out something that's not right, they bring you out the burger on a bun, cut it in half. If you get a salad, take the sugar packet, take potato chips, take anything, and stick it in the bottom of the salad bowl and send it back, because then you know that they didn't just take the croutons off and re recycle the salad back to you. So you need to do something so that when that plate comes back out, you know it's a clean, fresh plate and there's been no croutons on it. Now, it is, you know, people say, well, is it that important? It is. It's your health. We want you to be healthy and well. Okay, because this is what we should be feeling like or sleeping, that's okay. <laughs> and when we look at all this, and we look at how careful we need to be on the diet, how many people feel real enthused about doing this? Because you're gonna feel healthy, but it's tough. And we've actually seen where, when we look at quality of life studies, we've seen, and we're just, just to kind of give you a scenario, it's not easy. Now, we looked at three European studies, because in Europe they say, oh, be on a gluten-free diet. It's easy, it's a piece of cake, we can do this. And when we look at the different studies, we see that when people are diagnosed, their quality of life improves and it almost matches those people in Europe. When we looked at um, the study by Siachi in Italy, she did say, she noted that, you know, on the bottom line, that about six months after the diet, that her patients were kind of angry, kind of depressed. Well, you've had to make this major change. And if you're living in Italy, that can be tough. But after that time, it all went up to an equal to the regular population quality of life. Why is that important? Because here in the States, all of our studies are completely different. All the studies we've done where we've asked people about living the gluten-free lifestyle and what it's like, we find it's not the same as the regular population. In each of the different studies that we look at, the areas that are most commonly affected, and I, you can tell me, dining out, traveling, Social um, things like if you have family parties and barbecues, those are the things that we see time and time again are n have huge negative impact on our quality of life. The study from Canada even, a huge number, 83% of, the, of their Canadian support group members reported that they would choose not to travel, 
not to dine out because it's just too difficult. Now to me, as a I wear several hats, as a dietitian, but also as a mom who has celiac and her son has celiac, that means we're not doing a good job. So we have to do something different to make life better. This is one of the things we do. But also, we need to look at these different areas and really work very closely with restaurants and travel agencies and things to make this better. Because what we can see is the areas that were most impacted were dining out, traveling, family. Work was not as big of, a, of an issue, but those other very social a aspects were. We also then said, and that's why I asked how many people were newly diagnosed versus being on the diet for a while, we find that over time, the impact seems to lessen. And you can say, well, that's a good thing. But then when you look at this again, you say, but wait a minute. Even if you've been on the diet for 10 years, 30% of the people still say it's tough to dine out and eat. So we're getting better, but we have a long way to go. So that's what we need to do. And when we look at this and say, if it's difficult to be on the diet, even when you've been doing it for a long time and you're still struggling, how does that affect how good we are? And at first I thought, oh, this is so great. I asked my patients, how many of you are really good on the diet? And they're like, oh, we're doing it 100%. So I'm like 98% and said, oh, we're perfect. And I said, oh, I feel so good. I'm such a good dietitian. And then I said, well, but if you were to get eat gluten or not be as careful, where would it be? And it was in all the social aspects. And we found that it didn't matter, male or female, everyone cheated. Everyone cheated. And I think that it's not just that it was because they were in New York City and ate out all the time. But I think it just reflects that it's hard to do this on a day-to-day -day basis. What was really surprising is when we looked at the difference between men and females um, and broke it down by ages, the younger people between like 19 and 25 tended to be the ones that cheated more often than people older or younger. And gentlemen, young men between 19 and 25 on a first date cheated 100% of the time rather than have to say, they were on a gluten-free diet. And so what that tells us is the difficulty in trying to do this. And when you're at that very social at age, it's very hard. And we need to kind of look at that a little differently. The other thing we realize that makes compliance hard is the cost of the food. And I don't have to tell you, gluten-free food is two to three times more expensive than, than regular wheat-based things. But the other thing that worried me is when we look at this whole aspect of the gluten-free diet is, okay, we know that the cost is an issue. We know sticking with the diet is an issue. But you know what? The gluten-free diet itself, it's our only treatment. It is our medicine. But how good is this medicine that we're taking? And what we find is that it's not that great. A wheat-based diet, as we said, is fortified. It's good for you. If we look at some of the gluten-free products, and this is just a pretzel. That nice blue line is a regular wheat-based pretzel. That maroon line is a gluten-free pretzel. It has a third more calories, five times as much fat, and no B vitamins, because it's not required to be fortified by the FDA. So even what we would perceive as a healthy snack, we might as well apply it to our arteries and our hips, because it just is not that good. So we looked at that and said, well, if that's the case, we're just looking at pretzels. What else do we need to worry about? And we've, I'm gonna just do three quick studies that were done Thompson, Tricia Thompson is a dietitian here in the States, and we worked together on this and looked at food records from 43 different um, members of a support group. And what we found is that most people on a gluten-free diet tended to eat white rice as their main starch product, but the food that was most commonly eaten overall were gluten-free donuts. How many of you have had gluten-free donuts? You could use them as doorstops, hockey pucks. I mean, they're horrible. They're absolutely, you know, and you, and you definitely want to apply them to your hip. Um, but that was the most common thing eaten, which raises several questions. The other thing we found is that none of the people met the recommended dietary allowances, which then says, okay, this is our medicine, this is our diet, but it's not a real healthy one. So we said, well, is that just here in the States? And so we looked at studies that were done, again, the same Dr. Dickey in Europe, and he found the same thing. With his patients, he followed them for several years, and he found that on the diet, they all gained 20 pounds. Right. Like I said, apply to your hip and arteries. It's just not so good. So it didn't matter what your weight status was when you started on the diet, across the board, everyone gained 20 pounds. The same thing happened to the group up in Finland. And here they looked at, well, why is that? Why are these people all gaining weight? Is it that they're eating more bread products? Are they eating differently? 
And he found that no, the people on a gluten-free diet were eating the same number of servings of bread and grains, but it's the breads and grains in particular that we're eating that are so unhealthy. So what does that do? We know the diet is increased in fat and calories. It's not fortified. It's got less fiber. For a medical prescription that's supposed to be a healthy lifestyle, we're not doing so well. So what can we do? We know typically breakfast, lunch, and dinner is rice, tapioca, rice bread, not stuff you'd write home about. But if we look back at all those grains we can have, we know that the things like millet and amaranth and sorghum and quinoa are all great grains. They're all gluten-free, and they provide a ton more nutrition. So what we said is if we changed just the bread part of the diet and said, instead of a rice cereal, we had you use gluten-free oats. Instead of a plain tapioca bread, we used one of the high fiber or multi-grain gluten-free breads. And instead of just plain rice, use quinoa for dinner. Would that make a difference in the nutritional profile of the diet? Question? Yes. Quinoa is a great, oh, it's a grain. It's a great grain. It is small. It actually looks like couscous. And you cook, have you ever had couscous, which is just a little wheat? It's a round rice, okay? Um, you cook the same way as you do rice. You, it's easy as a side dish, very bland, just like rice. But it's got as much calcium as a glass of milk. It has as much protein as a glass of milk. So it's yummy. Um, there's also Ancient Harvest makes a pasta out of quinoa. So you could do something just simple that way. But here's the really neat thing. You change the nutrition profile of the diet completely. You increase the protein twice. I mean, it's twice as much protein. You have three times as much fiber. And you now meet the recommended dietary allowances for niacin, fiber, niacin, thiamine, riboflavin. And you get all of your calcium just by using the quinoa so that we can make a huge difference in the nutritional quality of the, of the diet. So adding these grains that many of them are strange names or we may not know what to do with them do add good nutrition. But we also realize that you know there's always been that issue with oats. And our oats cross-contaminated. And we're recommending using the gluten-free certified oats. But do we need to worry about the other grains? And the answer is yes, we do. So. They add the missing nutrients, but cross-contamination is a big, big concern. We did a study, again, Trisha and I worked together on this. We took samples of all different grains, the quinoa, the buckwheat, and this, and tested them for gluten contamination. And what we found is that a third of the samples were highly, highly contaminated. If you look at this, you can see soy flour had 3,000 parts per million. What's, to be gluten-free, what's the level you need to be at? Okay. For something to be gluten-free, it should be 20 parts per million. A lot of these grains were 600, 200, 3,000 parts per million. So obviously not a good choice from that gluten-free perspective. So what do we do? We need to add the grains because they add the nutrition we need. They add the protein. They add all those nutrients we really, really need. But they're not labeled gluten-free. They may be contaminated. So we need to be very, very careful. We need to look for a gluten-free certification. The GIG group has a certification. CSA has a certification for products. So you need to look for that certification on those packages so that instead of just buying buckwheat to make buckwheat flour or buckwheat pancakes or something, you need to make sure it says it's certified gluten-free. You also need to look for an allergen listing, because if there's wheat in it, like if there's a buckwheat pancake mix, look to see if it has wheat flour in it, OK? So you, there's different things you can look to make sure. Also look to see if the company says it's done in a dedicated facility or if it's on shared equipment. If it's on shared equipment, put the box back on the shelf. Because when you look at, gluten, at, look at products that you need to buy, anything that's going to be manufactured in a facility that handles dry products, breads, crackers, flour mix, you need to be gluten-free. Why? Have you ever, how many people have baked? Okay. What happens when you're stirring up flour? It's everywhere. It's in the air. It takes 12 hours for that flour to settle. So if something is made in a facility that is also making things with wheat-based flour, unless they are making the gluten-free products 
first thing in the morning after cleaning all the equipment and everything has settled overnight, it's, not, it's going to be cross-contaminated. So anything that is dry where the flour could be aerosolized, you need in either a dedicated facility or where they have it on different equipment. Things that are wet, tomato sauce, uh, canned beans, they have to clean everything, otherwise it's all going to stick. Those things are okay. It's okay if they're manufactured in a facility that does other things. Progresso soups. Some of the Progresso soups are gluten-free. Some are not. Is that a concern? Not really, because when you think of the kettles and everything they have the soup in, it's got to be washed in between. Otherwise, it's, you don't even want to think about what's there. So if it's dry products, they need to be certified. If they're wet products, just read the ingredients carefully. Okay, and read the label carefully. Now, unfortunately, labels can be very misleading. The little pink slip says, please help yourself to our delicious bananas. And this was in a hotel lobby, okay? You know I travel too much when I'm taking pictures of the hotel lobby. But to me, those are not bananas, okay? Right now, our U.S. labeling law is as confusing as this because we do not have a gluten-free labeling law. Right now, we have an allergen statement that covers only wheat. It does not cover gluten. So if you look on that package, and it says contains wheat, that's great. But remember, gluten is in what? Barley and rye also. So you need to make sure that you're looking for all those ingredients. The good thing is that at least it does tell you wheat, but it doesn't tell you enough. We're hoping, and the FDA has said that by the end of the summer, although they've been saying this for several years, that they will have a gluten-free labeling law. And that will be great. It will actually say a gluten-free product and it will have to meet the standards. And what we're proposing, or what we've worked with the FDA to, to do, is that gluten-free will be, and we're not sure whether they'll say 20 parts per million or 10 parts per million, which is even stricter, and that products must be tested. So you're not going to have manufacturers of tomato products slapping gluten-free on there and charging you twice as much. It has to be a product that is manufactured to be gluten-free. Bless you. So that it, you're not going to get overcharged for things that you shouldn't be. But it will also give us the standard on which to, to, to look for. Yes? We'll make sure you get the slides. Yes, we, well, there, I, we, we will make sure that you do. Okay. Um, I'll work with the group so that you have all of that. And it is confusing because there's so much at first. There's just so much. The other confusing part, which is you led perfectly into this, USDA is different than FDA. USDA regulates all your meat-based products and your meat-based foods. So anything that has some protein in it, chicken nuggets, um, uh, chili, canned chili, is not regulated by FDA. And you say, well, that's okay. Well, yes and no. USDA does not have an allergen labeling law, and USDA does not have to follow FDA's labeling law. So if FDA says, we're going to regulate food and give you a gluten-free label, that covers all those dry products we were talking about, rice, uh, baking mixes, those kind of things. It doesn't cover chicken nuggets, canned soup, things like that, because those are regulated by USDA, which is very confusing. So what's the take home from here? Look for a gluten-free certification wherever you can. If it's a USDA product, read your ingredients very carefully. If it's an FDA regulated products, your rice, your pastas, your breads, your dry cereals, all that, just look for that certification and when the FDA law comes out, it will cover it. We are hoping that USDA will adopt it, but they haven't totally said they would yet, so we think they will. Okay, gluten-free should be this much fun and it should be that normal, but how can we take all this information we had and now make it that normal? We should feel not exhausted by the end of the day, okay? Nor should we feel like we're eating cat food, which some gluten-free products do taste that way. So, dining out. Because when we look at all this information, the areas that impact us the most, besides knowing what to eat, are those social things. How do we go out and eat? What do we do? Um, there are many stores, Meyer in particular. Uh, I was at, stopped at a Meyer yesterday to pick up stuff for our booth. And what I found was they had all kinds of options. So look for that salad bar in the store. Look for a store that carries gluten-free products and ask them, can you label stuff on your takeout? Can you label stuff in the store so that we, are, your shoppers, your loyal customers, 
know what to get. And quite honestly, life is busy. We need to be able to pick up that rotisserie chicken on some nights and call it a day for dinner. That's safe, but keep working with your stores to do that. The other thing is think of some of your prepared meals. Yes. Yes. Modified food starch FDA is cornstarch. Modified food starch USDA could be wheat. So when you're looking at deli meats, you want to look for a deli meat that says it's gluten free. Beets and Watson, Black Bear, um, Boar's Head. There's several of them that have a glute Hormel for their pepperoni. You know, there's several of them that have a gluten free seal on it. Look for that. Butterball turkey is totally out. Okay, you need a turkey that is a fresh turkey for Thanksgiving dinner. Question? Okay. Okay, because they, last year they said it wasn't, it was okay. All right, well then, thank you. Because that's, um, usually plain rotisserie chickens don't have anything added, but if they have a broth added to it, it could be a problem. Um, think ethnic. When someone had said Amy's products before, she has some neat little Thai bowls and Mexican things. Those are neat. Now, are you going to do prepared foods all the time? No, but when it, you're busy and you, you're getting the kids from softball or football or going to the doctor's or dentist, you need something that's going to make life simple. But always, always, always look at the ingredient label. What else can we do? Dining out, there are chains that have gluten-free menus. Red Robin has one. Outback has one. Um, what? Applebee's has one. So there's a lot of them. Um, look for those. But also when you go, besides looking for a gluten-free menu, talk to your waiter or waitress. Be nice to them because the more they like you, the more they think you're a wonderful customer, the more attention they're going to give you. Um, there are many restaurant awareness programs. Look for those. Um, order things that are naturally gluten-free. You know, when you go to a restaurant for breakfast, do you order scrambled eggs? No. IHOP puts pancake flour in their scrambled eggs, which is just gross on many levels, but um, <laughs> in their omelets also. So you want fried eggs, or you want to ask for egg whites, or something where they can't use the prepared stuff, okay? Ask for a plain naked steak. Speak to the chef if you don't think the waitress is listening to you. Explain that no gluten means no breads, no breadings, no croutons, no breadsticks, no crackers. Tell them what you need, okay? Yes. Very important. Mm -hmm. Just to make sure there's no marinade, absolutely. They do, they, and it happens. I mean, I've gone out where it's like I've gone to a place where it is a gluten-free menu, but it's a busy time, and it, you get contaminated, and it's just not good. So whatever you can do. Ladies, bet your eyes if you have a male waiter. Men, you know how to flirt. Anything it takes, you need to get your, you need to get your meal. Um, I call it the velvet hammer approach. Be very soft, but be very dramatic. As I said, my son, has celiac disease, as do I, and we were diagnosed kind of later. I was already doing research in this for 10 years before both of us got diagnosed, which is really rather ironic, but there you go. Um, we went out to eat one of the first times, maybe a month after we were both on the gluten-free diet, and you would think being in the business, you would kind of get this, and so I go through my little thing. Please be very careful. I need to be gluten-free. That means no wheat, no da 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 And my son looks at me and goes, Mom, and the waiter, uh, he go, I said, what? He goes, you're not going to get what you want. I'm like, it's going to be fine. I ordered, you know, a salad. I mean, how bad could it be? A salad, plain chicken, we should be safe. So the waiter goes to him, well, what would you like? And he goes, if you mess up my meal, I will die. I will just keel over, and that lady will sue you. And I'm, I'm embarrassed. I'm about ready to crawl under the table. And I'm like, Patrick, he goes, no. If you don't get this right, I will get violently ill, and we will never come back, and I, will, I may die. And long story short, our meal comes out. His is perfect. The manager delivers his to his plate. Mine, I get the waiter who does it. And my salad has croutons on it. There's a sauce on the chicken. And I'm thinking, you know, I should know better. But obviously, being dramatic sometimes, 
works. It also, for young people, I would say it empowers them. If they can do this and get exactly what they need, that's going to give them great skills for later in life. So let them be. I kind of say, you remember the old movie when Harry met Sally? Remember the diner scene? Not the second one, the first one, okay? So, <laughs> well, we actually are going to reference both because in the first one, they go in and Harry does, uh, I'll take a number three and he's done. And she goes, well, I want a salad, but I don't want tomatoes, I'm allergic to them. And I want the chicken on the side. And I want salad dressing on the side and I don't want this. And I want apple pie, but I want it warmed if you have strawberry ice cream. But if you don't have strawberry ice cream, I want my pie cold and I want vanilla ice cream, but I want the ice cream on the side, I don't want it on the pie. And so the waiter's like, okay, writes it all down. And Harry goes, you gotta be kidding. Well, the good news is, if you remember, I know it's Hollywood, but if you remember, their meal comes Harry's is fine, so is Sally's. Everything she asked for is right there. But then think about that next scene in the movie, okay, where everyone else goes, I want what she has, because we want gluten-free to be that normal. Maybe not that exotic, but that normal, okay? So be very specific. Be very to the point. Kind of think my son, think Sally, that you want your chicken naked. Now, I used to wait tables in college, and when you say you want it plain, how many ways can you describe plain? It could be anything. I love my food hot and spicy. So my kids call my food fire-breathing dragon food. So to me, plain is hot and spicy. Plain to the waiter may be marinated. It may not be just plain. So you need it naked, because no matter how old that waiter is, they know what naked is. And that's how you want your food, OK? Doesn't matter how old or where they're from, they know naked. Ask for things with just olive oil, just salt and pepper. And although it sounds very, very boring, it's more important to be safe than boring. And it's more important that you're out and you're doing it and you're doing it well. So those are the things we can do. And emphasize, no croutons, no breadsticks, and sabotage that plate if it comes out wrong and send it back. Traveling, go, absolutely go. In some cases, it's easier to travel abroad than it is here in the States. In Italy, they get gluten-free. If you're lucky enough to be diagnosed with celiac disease in Italy, you're given two, day, two paid days off a month to take care of your doctor's visits, your shopping, whatever you need. You're also given a prescription for your basic gluten-free food. So your bread, your pasta is covered. And then you get 200 euros to buy those other things, the cookies and the good stuff, all right? Your doctor's visits are covered. Your endoscopy is covered. We should all like move to Italy. If we can't do that, at least we should go visit because you can get gluten-free in any place you go. If you um, are traveling on the highways, you know the little gas stations we have here that have the 7-Elevens and food courts and whatever? You go to the ones there, not only do they have really good coffee, but on that counter are gluten-free cookies, gluten-free sandwiches, gluten-free to go. It's easier. Not every country in Europe is as easy. France is a little bit trickier. The UK and Ireland, you can get gluten-free scones for breakfast, like you feel like you've died and gone to heaven. So go if you can. Even going to Canada is easier than here in the States. So I would say go. There's all kinds of international support groups, gluten-free roads, gluten-free dining cards, all kinds of things. I think Triumph Dining actually has a booth here today, so talk to them too. And they would have good information for traveling in the States. Okay, so also, Besides going, make sure you always pack your emergency little kit. You're allowed to carry on, you're allowed fluids up to three ounces. That's not a lot of food, okay? But Skippy peanut butter makes little peanut butter cups that are under the three ounces. The tuna in a foil pack will be allowed in. The other thing is talk to your doctor and on a prescription pad or a prescription piece of paper, have him write that you must be allowed to take your food on board. Now, TSA has agreed that if you have a prescription that says you must be allowed to take it on board, they have to let you through. Now, you're not going to be able to bring in an like eight ounce bottle of something, but you'll be able to bring a yogurt in or, or a pudding cup or something that will get you through. You need to have emergency food when you're traveling because once you go through security, what's on the other side? It's all fast food stuff. And there's very few airports that really have gluten-free products. The other thing is there's a lot of the cheese companies do individually wrapped cheeses, take cheese and crackers. Make it fun. Pick a treat. This would be when you pick up your cookies or your gluten-free donut, a better one, 
um, <laughs> and take it with you. But make sure that you have something to go. Okay. All different resource centers, all different support groups, contact them. Your local groups here are amazing for everything that they do. Um, different websites, and that's why we'll make sure that you can get these handouts. And on the internet, there's some things that are great, but be very careful. There's some websites that are not very great, and you need to read things carefully, okay? And references. 